Well, I'm here today to see the exhibition, also to speak to Robing, find out her thoughts on the work and maybe share my own on conservation and art and the relationship of, you know, artists and ecologists. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, so you have seen how Mary David has been used in this artwork. Oh, what's your thought about it? That's a good question. I, I think, in a way, I'm thinking of so many things. Memories of the ocean, my own experiences with the ocean, also my work as, uh, as somebody trying to, like you, protect oceans and the, the ability for our children to, to experience it in the way we have. There's so many emotions. I'm still trying to kind of parse through them and, 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 and kind of make sense of this. Uh, but I, 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 I'm, I'm in, I've been very inspired by, by this thing. And I, I just wanted, well, so my question is to you, when, when you put this together, did you have a, a, a kind of particular set of objectives, you know, like, and is your audience, I mean, or are you thinking of a particular audience when, when you do something like this? Um, this work um, is site specifically conceived for commerce space. So I want to create this immersive experience. So offshore on tide is an idea of entering wave, like a diver, a, like a fish, that you are inside the wave and then you see those marine debris from various parts of the world, um, fishing net, um, oil containers, plastic bottles, the swimming around you. And how do you feel about it? So uh, this work is, is site-specifically conceived in that way, allowing the audience to enter the work. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know what, like, when I see it, I, it, it's, I mean, some of the objects, they're, they're kind of cute. Some of them are almost sad. There's somebody's, there's some kid's trophy from a sports competition, a toy, and it almost be, well, if it wasn't so tragic, like this is marine debris that's 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 really harming marine ecosystems, which are already in trouble even without this, which were already in trouble even without the plastic. Um, it, it's it yeah I, I I'm very conflicted. I I it's 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 beautiful and mesmerizing in in a way, but it's also just it, it, it's it's in your face. All we we throw this. We, I mean, our ocean, this precious ocean, we're just throwing things in it. It's totally avoidable. I don't know if, so I see it, I kind of, I do get upset. I mean, I don't know if that's what you want. want are you happy <laughs> that, I, that there's this reaction? Are you trying to elicit any kind of particular? Uh, for this piece uh, of work, I deliberately choose bigger objects. Okay. I think bigger objects, hard objects, is uh, to serve as a confrontation purpose. So when you see it, you know it. And when the, the object creates sound, because this is kinetic and sound installation and create this kind of unavoidable attention to it. Uh, I remember that we had a conversation before that you mentioned about, actually they are, the, the most problematic actually is a microplastic, which is invisible. So, um, yeah, so, for, for visual art, for fine arts, we try to use something that's able to uh, depict, able to show the issues around us. This reminds me about um, uh, uh, Chris Jordan. I think his name is Chris Jordan, a photographer, that he depicts the, uh, the plastic that's consumed by dead birds. And that, that photograph is just so striking. And um, so disturbing as well that how much, you know, hum human-made um, uh, objects has end up uh, com to be consumed by by uh, by nature, um, and the microplastic even more dangerous because we don't see right. Yeah. You, well, um, yeah, and some of those drums that those pieces you can see they're old enough where they started to sort of flake away or degrade a little bit, and I mean. That it's broken down into yeah. microplastics, and so mm -hmm. you, it, it's it's you, it, you don't have to say anything, but if you, you take a look, you, you kind of get a sense of what what this issue is. Um, 
you know, like, like if I, if I teach, I, I feel sometimes like I have a, oh, I'm a, I teach science, right? So it's the science of ecology or the science of, of conservation. And, um, we're, we're supposed to be neutral about these, just give them the facts, give them the concepts, here's the situation. And then let's let the student, if, if there's any kind of value related, um, implication for it, then that's up to the student to try to explore and come up with the, their, their own sense of, of, you know, here's, for example, marine plastics and its impact on, on uh, ecosystems and on uh, the food chain in the, in the ocean. On the other hand, I, I feel like if this was, if, if this is a student, but if, if I had a sibling or a close friend or child, I, I would feel morally obliged to actually tell them that I think this is wrong and it's, it's, it's terrible and we have to do something mm -hmm. to prevent it. But sometimes in class, I'm, I, I, I'm torn. Do I have to, it should, should it be my obligation as a human to actually, and as a scientist to, to not only say, here's the issue, but here's how terrible and awful it is, or should I, is it more powerful for the student to whether maybe they won't come to any kind of personal conclusion, but if they did, then be more powerful because they weren't told what to think. They just arrived at that. Uh, do you, are you confronted with it? I guess if, if you told people what to think, then you're not, not an artist anymore. I don't know. I'm, how, do, how do you? I, I, I think uh, artists, uh, oh. Uh, different from scientists, um, we use data, we use research, but we use in a, a creative way. So we um, we have this direct access to um, to to the audience in in uh, physical spaces in the visual confrontation. So see, this is the color, and this is the object, and this is we found. I think. Art and artists and scientists function a different way to pass on a similar message. Hey, this is the issue. Yeah. So let's think about it. Let's, let's find ways to do it. Um, and scientists play a very important part, uh, in this tackling those issues. And for me as an artist, I always enjoy working with scientists, uh, for my, throughout the almost over 10 years in working on the marine debris issues. I have been fortunate to working with uh, many wonderful individuals um, like uh, Siva Ottoman. Right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, and many institutions as well, um, volunteer uh, groups, like um, one of the groups I work with is our Singapore Reef. I think they are a group of NUS students, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so from NUS. Um, so they have, they all do their individual parts in, in uh, inspiring the public to put a, a little bit effort, a, a little bit step into, uh, into those issues. Yeah. For art, uh, artists, um, I think art is like an agent of saying as well. They use visual language using uh, different ways of inspiring people to think further. What has been missed? What has been uh, why? What the priority should be put with? Yeah. Have you have you have you read read a book uh, by uh, Richard Dawkins? One of his books, called Un Unweaving the Rainbow. So, oh, no. so he, he he deals with this issue. It's kind of interesting. So. Well, so I, I think it, it's a reference to, to something that the poet Yeats uh, once said that the, he, he, who I'm trying to, I hope I got this right. When, a, when, a art, when somebody looks at a rainbow, you see beauty and you see a symbol. I mean, there's hope and there's a lot of um, emotion. It's a metaphor for so many things. And he felt sorry for the scientists who can explain it as just white light being broken up by a prism, uh, the, the, you know, the rain as a prism to split the white light into its, its different wavelengths. So in a way, the, 
looking at the rainbow through the eyes of a scientist kind of kills the whole beauty and the romance of the rainbow. So that, that would be kind of like this typical, here's how the, maybe the regular person or artist sees the world and the scientist. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. I think in this case, um, Dawkins makes the argument that actually knowing the mechanism in a way can enhance the beauty because not only you, you perceive the beauty as such and you experience all those feelings like anyone else, but, but knowing kind of a, a mechanism behind it also makes it even more in a way wondrous and miraculous, better than a miracle because it, the physical laws of nature can explain it. So that's, God, that's really <laughs> talking too much, but so, so for me, I, if, if let's say I have a class or on a field trip, especially, I mean, I, I do hope that they learn all the science and everything, but I realize at the end of it, say five years later, the student is not going to remember the concepts. They won't remember the facts. I hope they do, but they probably won't, but they won't forget the experience just being outdoors sunshine falling on you and certain smells of the forest and songs of birds and everything. And so I, I do think, I, I mean, I, maybe it's expressed in a different way, but I think for the scientists, it's also very, it can be a very emotional experience. Maybe even the lab scientists too, but, and, you know, I guess, how do you, how do we um, tap into that when artists and scientists or artists deal with scientific issues or scientists collaborate with artists. I think, I think that's still something that we haven't maybe tapped into fully yet. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what you think. In uh, fact, I think uh, both for the artists and scientists, we realize how important these two stream of thoughts can actually work together and um, um, come up something wonderful, right? So um, we noticed that um, there are many artist residency programs actually initiated by um, scientific lab uh, or, or science-driven you know, institutions. They invite artists to, uh, to go there and to work uh, to interpret the outcome that they have been uh, producing in the lab dryly <laughs> and they hope that the outcome could through the artistic strategy and reach a wider audience, um, reach people who uh, may not be able to read the scientific, uh, scientific report, but they can feel emotionally, um, read emotionally through the artistic practice. I see the growing trend uh, in this direction, mm -hmm. yeah. It, but it, it, this this kind of common thread in your work, right? You, where you link well, environment. I mean, you, you, it, it it's often environment. Yeah, it's often or usually environment related. Uh, for my my uh, personal practice, I'm very much interested in in. Uh, environment related issue. So Marie Debris is one of the issues that I'm looking at in those recent years. Uh, overall, I'm looking at how um, we read about these informations being provided, the knowledge being uh, available for us. For example, I have one, um, uh, one series called Eat Me. I used a thousands of um, a green covered book, um, f used book. So for example, I did one version in Singapore that I borrowed 1,000 over books from National Library Board. And those are used book. I use them to create um, a continuing uh, a line in a room at the Singapore Art Museum. So um, what I'm looking at is why and how the green color has been determined by the author and by the publisher and this topic supposed to have a green color cover. Uh -huh. okay. Why is that so? Why when we think about organic food, gardening, cooking, and then we think we should have a green cover cover for the book. So that is one, you know, continual um, uh, investigation for me okay. on how so, so you, you you didn't just cherry pick the, the green covered books. I mean, it's not like they were red and 
magenta colored organic books? Is it really they they are really green? Yes, they okay. are all, all green <laughs> colors. Um, so um, so they are a green original colors. So, so I sorted with artistic strategy. Okay. I sorted by color chart. So from light green, slightly bluish green to uh, uh, olive green. So I arrange in such a such a, a spectrum of a color. So um, so that is uh, my intention is use the book. Um, so another another uh, series I did in Limerick in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So the organizer allowed me to go to a local uh, library. So I they clear up a huge bookshelf for me. I basically go to the library and shop for the green books and arrange them in the within the library. So it's just a green wall of. Uh, of green books and the classification is by color. You know, all uh, library has their standard right. classification, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? You know where to find a book and what to find book. But for for you know artistic practice, that we create our own system, we create our own look. <laughs> so it, it's a functional uh, artwork for that piece at the Limerick because the public still can go to the library and. Take out the book, but of course they have to put it back to the to the original the position. Yes, <laughs> like pen, to keep... tone kind of. <laughs> yes, okay. yes, yeah, yeah. That's uh, overall. I'm looking at those issues um, relates to the environment. Yeah. I was. I mean, you told me before. I mean, I just, I, I was curious about how, how. What really struck me about this work. Uh, is um, and and some of your other work that were related to the ocean, you actually you were telling me you actually didn't see the ocean till you were well into your teens. Is, is that right? Eighteen years 18 old. Eighteen years yeah. old. And so, what what is it because of the novelty of it that that drew you to the ocean? I mean, it, it, I, I just. I find it very interesting, you know, like what, what did you think, for example, when you first saw the ocean or you've seen it so many times on TV that it was, okay, here it is, or, or was it, did it pull you in some way? I don't know. Well, uh, you, when I first saw it, I think I just can't ignore it. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's just there. And um, I, I remember my favorite activity as a student, um, we spent weekend. Yeah, we go there and we have a walk. And this is cheapest as well yeah, as a student, right? So we go there for uh, for some, uh, for food, for a walk, um, spend some time. And as an artist, I think it's become very, uh, it, it's become a calling for you. So artists always spend a lot of uh, attention to our own environment. What happened to our environment? What are the issues we are dealing with every day? So um, since I'm interested in the relationship between human and nature, I think living in this sea state and it's just kind of avoidable. I, I feel sea come to me rather than I come to it. Of course, I come to it when I traveled from China to here. That's the first time. And then, then gradually I think sea is just something that is always in my mind. Um, when I came back from my study, and decided to um, to stay here for a longer period of time, and I think just the sea, the idea of the sea, has come to my practice very naturally. Yeah. Okay, so I want to trade notes with you. Then I'm thinking, if you think of your colleagues, artist colleagues, your friends in this community, your students, or just the people that you meet um, every day, do. You, it's, it's, so we're a maritime, we, we know it, right? We, we're a maritime country, we have trade, we depend on the oceans for, for our, our livelihoods in that sort of broader economic kind of way. But do you think we have kind of an ethos or, or just or the, is the ocean kind of in our value system? You know, in, in, not, not you personally, but... but out there, I mean, do you feel we're uh, the the oceans kind of in our consciousness in, in Singapore? Mm, well, I think um, for me, uh, because I'm not a scientist, right? right. Um, I don't really walk on uh, sea every day, and um, but I think CB is very good. 
a way to observe it. Um, so when 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 COVID nineteen hit it, Singapore and nobody can travel, and then we realize that whenever we go to East Coast Park, it's all packed with people. Right, right, right. So um, so people start to notice that. Yeah, from any point when you travel, you end up to the sea. Yes. Yeah? So when you are not able to fly, and that's the place you can go actually. Yeah. So I I really uh, happy to see <laughs> people spending more time yeah. around the sea. Um, but of course, I also heard a lot that uh, like Pulau Ubin, St John's Island has been stressed up <laughs> because of you know uh, people go. Uh, uh, you know, spending more time and the visitorship double up. So, um, so okay, you... yeah. So that's it. That's so that's the. I, again, I'm I'm trying to come to grips with it myself. So, people go to the sea, in 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 unprecedented numbers. I think Pula Ubin. I mean, taking that bumbo and you certainly experience the sea. But I'm, you know, this is the, our, we go to the sea, and we we we. We have barbecues next to the beach and everything, but I, I'm wondering: Do we really, if you have the ocean in your consciousness? I mean, like you really think about it, you you feel for it, and, and I'm even saying this as a scientist too, right? A ecologist, wouldn't we then? It, then it would then it would become something important to us, not just a place that we use for some. In the benefit, like go and splash around and then go home, or or ride a kayak and then we're done with it. I mean, it, it, that that's using the sea, but I'm not sure if that's being it, it kind of integrated and having you know this ocean is a big part of your life. Because if it was the case, then we'd be taking better care of it. We wouldn't be l allowing. These plastics and these terrible things to be just dumped in the sea. We would, we would actually care that you know the seafood that we so love, we're just eating it unsustainably, mm. and we don't care where it comes from or how it's produced. There's no you go to the market. There's no sustainability. Well, I mean, things are changing a little bit, but if you went and ask uh, somebody. Where is this fish from? How did they catch it? Was it from a sustain? Nobody knows, and maybe maybe it's changing. But I wonder if we really are kind of a maritime society in that way. I, 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 so, do we have the deeper relationship with the sea? Yeah. So you are you are from Hawaii. <laughs> you <laughs> yes, grew yes. up in yeah, the yeah. sea. Yes, yes, beach. yes. Um, I remember you told me that you visit your grandma uh, every weekend, right. and I just go to the beach because uh, uh, her house is just next to the beach, right? So how about in Hawaii? Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I can't speak for everybody, but certainly, I mean, for for um, people in Hawaii, the ocean is is it's really part of your uh, life and lifestyle. So whether it's recreation, um, so running next to the sea or swimming or canoe paddling or if it's uh we have family gatherings or celebrations um of course we do that here too but, but i i think um I, I remember as a kid going to the beach and of course we'd swim and you know all those water fights and everything with the cousins and everything but at the same time there was a lot of time to just walk around and spend time you know on our own, my cousins, me, my uncles and aunts, and you, you know, you, you have hours, hours just to look at things or to feel the water, or I, I guess it, you don't think about it at the time, but maybe you're kind of developing some sort of kinship with that uh, ocean. It's the same relationship that your grandparents had and their parents, and you know, so it. it uh, not trying to make too much out of it, but the sea does become something important that you're invested in it emotionally, not just because you can catch fish in it or 
uh, splash around. And that's, that's important too. But, and, and so then when you see things happening to the sea that are completely avoidable, then, you know, you, you, it's, it's kind of, you get angry. It's, it's in the same way that somebody uh, has harmed a friend or a relative or, or something. It's, it just seems like a you know, violation. I mean, you described the albatross eating mm. the plastic. Mm. And I think that's how you feel when you see all that plastic mm. and, you know, that these little albatross chicks, their stomachs engorged with plastic and they just rot it away to just a skeleton, you know, just something, it, it's very wrong about that, right? I mean, mm. the, and as you say, the art really brings that out. But I, I yeah, I, I, I think um, I'd love to see us here in these coastal cities get angry about what we've done to our oceans. Maybe they want to do science and study this phenomenon or maybe become an engineer to try to kind of come up with some solutions to, to removing waste or preventing it in the first place or more people like you who, who want to elicit some sort of response in people to all of this that otherwise we don't even think about. I mean, if, I mean, I'm now thinking about if we went to the sea now, there'd be just so much trash in that mm. water, you know? Mm. So yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think I'm not sure if we're there yet. And I'm, I'm not saying that the Hawaiians do any a better job of looking after resources than anybody else, but certainly um, being on an island and that's all you have. And if you deplete the food, that's it. So you have to manage it well. Mm. I, I think that that kind of enters into this. It, it, there's a value associated with sort of the environment and caring for it. Um, mm. Did you see that in the UK or Ireland when you were there? Well, my stay is very brief. Mm. Um, and I always stay in the inland as well. So my, my Ireland project is just one of project. It's a binale, so you invited to spend maybe 20 days there. So our, our uh, relationship to uh, those places is very brief. Yeah, but uh, just like, I think just like um, this hour of show on time, the idea of, you know, things, man-made things being dropped off from our hand, end up to the sea and offshore for the time being, and you will pick up um, by the tide, right. so on tide, yeah. and continue to flow to other uh, shore and other places. So it's a circular journey. It's uh, we are all part of that. We are part of no matter in Hawaii, in in, in Singapore, on island or UK. Um, we are just in this you know circular uh, context, and we are the issue and we are the solution as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I couldn't agree more. But it just, you know, the o oceans is very forget. I mean, it, it, it's, it's all, it can be dangerous too, right? And the storms and waves and tides. And if you're not, if you don't give it respect, I think it can, it can harm you too. But it's pretty forgiving as well. I mean, think of all the, I mean, we take things from it. We, we, uh, dump historically even today dump sewage into the sea and maybe if it's the sea will maybe break some of it down or dilute it out we're about to dump radioactive water from fukushima into the sea and hopefully it gets diluted and so it, it there's a lot of resilience to it you know and um despite all of this these um I don't know the kind of I wouldn't call it disrespect, but all the the impacts that we're making. But it it, it can it's still bounce back after a while. But yeah, I just I still again it's that that thing I'm trying to grapple with. You know, it it it, it is kind of a, a sacred place. I, I I think for us sort of humanity and also just the way it it keeps us alive. So many people depend on it for food and everything. And if it's so important, why are we doing this, you know, to the ocean? I, I, I just don't get it. Mm. Um, but I, I, but I don't, I think graphs and tables, yeah, uh, showing all of these impacts as, 
I would suppose if I was going to do a report uh, or a paper. I, I guess that doesn't really pull at the kind of hit you in the gut, I, I suppose, in the way that what you've done here can do. I mean, I, I think you were saying about some of your people who come to see the exhibit, they, they interpret it in different ways, like if they were a diver or a fish or mm. a, yeah, oh. so uh, the show opened uh, yesterday on 17th April. So I, uh, I received a very uh, beautiful and touching uh, comments. Um, one of the audience was saying that, oh, I can imagine if I'm a fish, uh, the pollutants, the plastic uh, swimming beside me can be quite dangerous. I, I feel that, like, wow, you know, um, this is what exactly I want to do, achieve. <laughs> you know, the wave, you are in there. I imagine you are part of that. Yeah, how do you feel about it? Yeah, would you like to see them? Probably you're not, right? If you're a diver, you want to see coral, you want to see fish, you want to see, you don't want to see plastic bottles, you don't want to see a fridge, right? <laughs> Being dumped into, into um, the, the, the sea bed. Yeah. So that's um, the message that um, had the experience. I think this one need to um, experience because it's really um, you are inside there. You can feel about the issues. You, um, yeah. It's. I hope the sound and the movement will will um, touch you in 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 a way. Yeah. Okay. Well. So okay. So I have then another question. So I. I mean. Um, there's a jerry can which has barnacles on it mm. so it must have been floating in the ocean for quite mm. a long time and there's a, a bucket a broken bucket with oysters actually oysters mm. lots of them mm. that not only were growing in the bucket but somebody actually harvested the oysters too mm. um did you did you was it the aesthetic thing or is the, is that is there some ecological message that you uh, uh, were thinking of, about when you picked those two objects? Mm, when I picked those, because of Mary Debbie, it's just massive. Yeah. Yeah. So it's impossible to collect all things I want. <laughs> and also a storage space was one of the issues. Um, so what I collect, I collect things that can be cleaned that can be stored, can be used for art. Um, so um, most of them actually very, very dirty when I collect them. So I, I take time to gradually clean it up. So um, not at the first sight, I can see uh, the things attached to, to the surface, but it's just to come this way because when, when the things floating inside the sea for long enough, things attached to it, things grow on it. Um, yeah, that's, that's um, just like uh, I mentioned about, I use the book, the, the book that has been read. It's not the new book from the book sh book, uh, bookshop, but the, the, the object has, has the history we can track. We, we we know that it has been um, has been used where this is from. I like the guessing. Yeah? Right. Many people come here and guess about oh where is this from, yeah. And we have a trophy from Malaysia, right? And so th that's that's exactly what I'm looking at. The objects is is I'm looking at the human object, okay. the object that made by humans that come with a history, come with a, a, a kind of. Um, uh, interpretation that we could imagine and think about it. Yeah. I mean, so for me, I see the the, the like the blue jerry can. So you, you know, barnacles they 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 cement themselves to a, a surface, and so and so as 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 larvae, they're like little they're like little prawns. I think they they they're also in that they're crustaceans like prawns, and so they're swimming around, and then I I don't know if they make a decision in the way that we would make a conscious decision but they when they find a surface they f they basically flip upside down and they glue their back to the surface and mm -hmm. then once once they've done that they're committed <laughs> they can't mm -hmm. they i don't think they uh, can 
um, dissociate, they can um, remove themselves and find another place. Mm. That's it, you know. So I, I, I mean, I'm thinking about these barnacles who swimming in the sea. They should be, at least historically, they would find a rock or, you know, some more permanent object. But then they, they touch a plastic jerry can and they glue themselves and they basically tie the rest of their the entire fate to this plastic mm. junk that's in the oh mm. so I, I find that I mean it's in a way it's heartening that nature is kind of resilient in that way but it's also I think kind of tragic it's it's hitched a ride on a piece of floating rubbish mm. basically and same with the oysters I mean in mm. the bucket they, they mm. also float around and they mm. they the, Find a surface, find a surface and, and, yeah, and, to and they're committed. Mm. Um, they're committed. They're committed. That's it. They're, you can't go anyplace else. You know, they're, they're oh, like it or not, dear. they're on this piece of mm. marine junk. But mm. um, but it also shows, I suppose, that in a way, it's uh, that ocean is is pretty resilient. And if we if we maybe get rid of this, uh, if we can tame this plastic, you know, pollution problem maybe things could get better pretty quickly i don't know but I, I i i i don't know i shouldn't feel i'm i shouldn't feel sad for the little barnacle but i kind of do it's it's um it just seems so what's the what's the word it just seems so futile but but there's a whole there must have been a whole colony of barnacles on that mm. jerry can right so yeah. so maybe they had happy lives i don't know I've always wanted to ask ask you this, mm-hmm. Robin, about the the first time I think I saw you working was um, almost almost twenty. Well, should I say <laughs> <laughs> a few a few years a few years ago a few years ago? Um, remember there was that tree at Changi, Hopia the Hopia Sangal, that got cut, yeah. and I first met you through that, and and you you were one of the artists who took a section of that mm. ancient tree that had been. Uh, tragically cut down and then you, you you did a piece of work on it and so when you did your carving along with your, your colleagues each each of you who, who took a piece of that um, ancient tree what 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 were you thinking uh, about and what, what did you want to convey through that piece and and, and how does that you know that that approach uh, to do, creating uh, informs your current work. Wow, this really brought me back. <laughs> That's a very, very important um, event in my in my own practice, uh, in my involvement with uh, with uh, nature as well. So at that point of time, I was volunteering with Sculpture Society. You know, sculpture, sculpture. I was trained as a sculptor, so uh, carving wood, marble is some of the things we do uh, all the time. So when Hopia Sangha tree was were full filled, and uh, the the ex president of um, Sculpture Society, Han Sai Bo, um, so we we discussed and we decided to to take over those nine pieces of trunk and to work on something, to pass on a message. They shouldn't be thread like uh, wood dust, that, that's it. Um, they should, we should leave this message for, um, for longer period of time. And what happened to this tree? Why this happened, right? How, how could this happen in the first place? So that was... Um, that that was how uh, Hopia Sangha tree has been preserved, and for me it was really fortunate because uh, through that through this event I get to know Nature Society, I get to know uh, Joseph Lai, <laughs> <laughs> I get to I met Siva and those passionate um, people who really take care of the nature of Singapore and um, they devote their their, their time and. Um, um, you know, invested their in expertise on this. So they become my long-term friends. Along my journey working on this, this topic, they has, have been my advisor. Even for this, uh, for this show, I have objects from Joseph Lai. So when I were working um, throughout the years, I collecting Mary Debris um, time to time. So uh, Joseph 
Oh, before he was retired, he was working at the Chet Java, and so he kindly helped me to <laughs> collect bags, bags of、uh, marine debris, and I then I took the boat to Pulau Ubin and took them back to the mainland and washed them clean and stored them in there. So, yeah, so that's、uh, yeah, that's the event.、Um, how I started involved with with uh, uh, with conservation. Um, using art as a strategy since then, yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. You know, so for me, the the work that you and Han Sai Po and the others did, it was interesting because how do you, you know over something that seems so senseless and completely avoidable,、uh, tragic? Is that too strong a word? Or just certainly very, very、uh, frustrating.、Uh, and how how can one channel those? Feelings,、um, in a way that becomes this sort of almost permanent form of expression. You kind of take those feelings, and there it is. It's there for anyone to see, for however long that piece of work. And it's you know, it's wood is going to last for outlast us.、Um, and I, I th- that was very important thing for me too as a, a scientist. Of course, I can write an opinion piece, but.、Um, It's it's uh, uh, that alone really doesn't make strong enough a statement sometimes, and it's easy to forget. But when that art confronts you,、um, and in this case, it, it's not just visual; it's it's the whole this movement and their sound and everything.、Um, it's it's interesting for me to see how 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 your work has kind of evolved. Too and and I,、um, I hope lots of people get to see it. Thank you. And, <laughs> and I, I, it would be like this great honor if if I could take a look at it with you yeah. now. Yeah.、Oh. Let's have a look. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.